Well, hello. Today is September 12th, and um, I found it necessary to make a, a video, which is really a follow-on uh, from my yesterday um, address, so to speak, and the talk. And before I proceed, I want to st tell people, because I, in hundreds of uh, um, comments to my video and, and my blog, actually, uh, very many people who, you know, uh, lean towards their version of the events of 9-11, that it was Mossad operation, that Jews did it, or that it was CIA operation and all. Hey, you know what? Just uh, leave me alone, guys. Follow whatever you believe in, okay? So I'm not in any way trying to convince you one way or another. I, uh, I want to quote my really good friend, and he is senior officer, uh, uh, you know, in the U.S. Uh, armed forces, he is former, uh, and he says, you know, I don't buy either, you know, neither uh, versions, version of the collapse which was created by uh, some, you know, nefarious forces, you know, or that it was just purely uh, accidental that they, those people flew those planes into the building. So, guys, I'm in the, here not to convince you one way or another. I was talking about betrayal of the, you know, and the fake war on the terrorism, which wasn't really the real war on terrorism. So just in this case, leave me alone and, you know, go with whatever version you want. I'm not here to change your convictions on the matters which I don't understand. I'm not civilian or construction engineer. Pardon my French, but uh, you, you know what? Uh, just go with whatever you want. So if you love, want one version is fine with me, the second one fine with me. Just, you know, live your life any way you want. So now to the more uh, pressing issues. Uh, if you look uh, at this attentively, uh, you will recognize probably one of the greatest uh, comedy shots of, of the immortal airplane where Leslie Nielsen slaps some uh, uh, psychotic or... Uh, uh, um, passenger who, who becomes hysterical actually and then of course you all remember this wonderful moment uh of the whole line basically uh people uh getting ready to slap or kill her or beat the crap out of her so and it is absolutely hilarious but you know what uh in this uh really um comedic moment in uh, one of the greatest comedy movies of all time uh, there is a really great sense, actually, and great psychiatric, not just psychological sense. And what they do when you have this hysterical passenger, they beat her, you know. And uh, no, no, I do not by no, uh, in no way condone, you know, beating women for crying out loud. But any gender, which are two of them in, among normal people and about 150 among all those screwed up people, but uh, be it man or a woman or a child sometimes, the only way to get uh, the person which is hysterical and is absolutely just going bananas is to slap, slightly slap on the face and just to create this small little shock and put uh, the person immediately in the control of their emotions and that's what is done very often in the war actually it happens all the time and so the reason i mentioned this is because of that so uh, as uh, you can see yourself uh, russians yesterday and today continue to, just to blow their uh, major infrastructure in ukraine using of course those caliber and onyx and other missiles which russia supposedly ran out of and as you can see yourself uh, it was yesterday that ukraine suffers massive blackouts a number of the uh, regions today it is known that kharkov uh, uh, attacks continued and right now kharkov uh, is pretty much uh, without electricity without water and this is just a start but it was this slap into the face uh, especially for the uh, Ukrainian public, and which was similar to what Leslie Nielsen and the line of people who were slapping that <coughs> hysterical passenger in the airplane. And uh, that's what you do. 
because obviously uh, on this absolutely hysterical pitch, I mean, uh, absolutely batshit crazy uh, madness which was happening in Ukrainian media and uh, uh, also Western media uh, related to uh, what the, they gained about uh, 2,000 square kilometers of the area in Kharkov uh, Oblast, it's, you needed to kind of show them that, yeah, well, it wasn't really your great success per se, as much as it was a Russian uh, indeed withdrawal, and I will talk about this in a second, and then, you know, uh, Russia just showed that, you know what, if you continue to do what you're doing with the, uh, for example, uh, Zaporozhye nuclear station, shelling it constantly, with Mr. Patrushev saying today that the United States and, uh, provides the targeting for uh, uh, Ukraine, so no surprise here. And uh, so it will continue, if they will continue this, you know, for some time again, shelling the nuclear power station, which is shut down, and it was providing 20% of the electricity for Ukraine as a whole. And then, of course, now you have those transformer stations. And again, mind you, these are not transformers you can uh, replace easily because it takes, it will take probably months. And yeah, so Russia will be shutting off uh, lights, water, and other utilities just in case, you know, Ukraine uh, doesn't behave itself at least within some frame, uh, of a proper framework as Russia wants. And he, it, that brings us to another, so to speak, um, issue, how uh, absolutely bananas and incompetent uh, uh, people in the Western media are. And for example, they still think that uh, everything what is happening and was uh, happening in uh, and around uh, Kharkov Oblast was some kind of surprise for Russians. No, just to give you an example today. Russians today, by the words of the uh, 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 ch chief, the head of the uh, Zaporozhye uh, um, uh, military civilian uh, administration, Mr. Rogov says, yeah, th they already know that the armed forces of Ukraine are preparing for the big offensive in the area of the Zaporozh Zaporozhye nuclear station, and they're trying to do the, those, you know, uh, temporary bridges uh, and uh, over the rivers so yeah you know it, it goes without saying that basically uh, it is well known to Russia what is going on it also Rogov states very clearly that United States and Great Britain are behind planning of that and uh, judging by the absolute I mean out of proportion hysteria and uh, enjoy, let's put it this way, uh, by uh, all kinds of the Western outlets and all kinds of the politicians, uh, you have to understand that uh, everybody tries to now take the credit, uh, you know, for, the, for allegedly successful, which it is not, by the way, we'll talk about this later, uh, offensive by uh, armed forces of Ukraine, and let me put it this way, it is a fine, fine Western tradition of the stolen valor and basically, you know, getting taking the credit where the credit is not due. And you may uh, uh, basically, uh, right now, those people who boast about uh, United States planning uh, all this and providing uh, the intelligence information uh, to Ukraine, let me remind you of this thing. Remember this, it was four years ago. Mr. Trump at that time claimed, uh, well, obviously, after for three years, Russia wiped the floor with the ISIS, that actually the United States has defeated the Islamic State in Syria. U.S. President Donald Trump claimed on Wednesday, adding that it was the only reason he kept troops in the country. It was one of those incredible bullshits. It's the same, very similar to the uh, uh, issue of the um, Anglo-American allies winning the World War II and defeating Hitler, which of course they didn't, because the bulk of the fighting and defeating the Axis forces was done by Red Army and the Soviet Union. But yay, yeah, it's nothing new. And to show you how headless, very uneducated and very classless actually those people are, we certainly have to. Uh, get uh, to such statements like this guy uh, and everybody knows him. He is Ben Hodges and I don't know if he is the product of the West Point. I mean, I would be really, I mean, ashamed to having people like that, you know. But here it is. 
Uh, he, the Ben Hodges, who obviously knows shit about Russia, and I suspect he is not very good general, as most American generals are, he says that the world should prepare for the collapse of Russia. Uh, and look what they remind uh, uh, us about. Ben Hodges, who was general of this army in Europe and served in Iraq and Afghanistan, made this prediction. Basically, serving in Iraq and Afghanistan is basically the really major stamp, which is stamp on the uh, uh, forehead uh, of many American and uh, Western uh, uh, senior and high-level officers, and it contains letter L. On it. it's letter L stands for loser, and as you understand, the one of the reasons the United States is so giddy and so uh, really delightful at this, I mean, basically tactical episode, frankly speaking, that they obviously take the credit, which actually is known. Mr. Nibenza and I quoted him a few days ago, the Russian permanent representative in the United Nations, uh, uh, um, at the United Nations. He will, he's uh, finally speak it and uh, brought sites and I quote him, uh, United States is manually, in the manual regime is involved in the conduct planning and conducting operations. And uh, as uh, uh, even this small little success which uh, they had, which is not really even that, I would say, necessarily operational, is one of the proofs of that. And uh, obviously they uh, do not understand those people who plan this in Pentagon and in London. They don't have the experience of uh, fighting their uh, proper enemy. And that is why uh, we already know that the uh, and, um, uh, losses of the Ukrainian side are horrendous. And we'll talk about this more. But what I want to say is, and I'm on record from the start, from the start of SMO, I'm telling you, and uh, it's you can look it up my uh, blog, and I was speaking about and writing about it nonstop. Pretty much most of the Ukrainian armed forces moves, tactics, operations, they have bear the hallmark of the American planning and uh, uh, command and control. And one of the reasons uh, uh, for that is the fact that you can see yourself that basically what has been conducted uh, for the last uh, half a year by the Ukrainian forces, it was one loss after another after another with the horrendous uh, losses in personnel and equipment, despite the fact that West is just absol was absolutely relentless in supplying the armed forces of Ukraine with the equipment, and we have those advisors, we have those mercenaries, and, but again, as I stated, especially as yesterday uh, and today strikes on uh, basically a crucial infrastructure in Ukraine uh, uh, demonstrated, Russia can turn off the lights pretty much in, uh, in the whole of Ukraine, like in, two, in 48 hours. It doesn't take much. I mean, it's all there. The weapons, the cruise missiles, uh, uh, intelligence, recon, uh, targeting. It, it's not difficult. People do not understand what this SMO, Special Military Operation, is about and uh, why it is being conducted. And uh, again, I want you to go back to the main st stated purposes of, the, um, uh, uh, of this operation by Vladimir Putin. De denazification and demilitarization. And I can tell you one thing, absolutely, especially for people who really follow the real news cycle with Russia advancing in Donbass, actually, and uh, primarily militias, but there are some Russian troops involved uh, there. It is uh, primarily demilitarization, which is, of course, utilization of the personnel and equipment of the enemy. And that is being done, I mean, absolutely on industrial scale. But the reason I also speak about the hallmarks, you know, though, that this is American operation, we can say it now, it's Pentagon. Let me give you some examples and some historical introspective in this. And here, uh, let's start with that. Uh, I will start with, um, you know, the thing which you might, you know, could be very surprised. Here it is. This is uh, the paper in 2001. Since then, it has been reiterated by Mr. Glantz and Jonathan House, two outstanding American military historians and cadre officers of the U.S. Army. 
but obviously it's the older generation of people who had enough class education and understanding of the warfare unlike it is today and he's talking about the soviet german war myth and realities and so survey essay and look what he states glance states in this essay here it is he talks about the fact that pretty much all, most historiography of the military historiography in the West, especially in the United States, was affected by Germans, by Wehrmacht. Look at this. This said realities have undercut the credibility of Soviet historical works, fairly or unfairly, permitted German historiography and interpretation to prevail and coincidentally damage the credibility of those few Western writers who have incorporated Soviet historical materials into the account of the war. He speaks about the fact that even today, and I can confirm this, the American historiography and American study of war is basically influenced. It actually has been shaped by the uh, German officers and uh, Wehrmacht experiences in the Eastern Front. Here it is. For example, if you go to uh, go, it's one of many, it's one of many papers uh, or, and historical studies which are conducted by U U.S. Army and especially Center of Military History. Look at this. It's called Military Improvisation During the Russian Campaign. And guess what it is? If you go and look it up, you will see yourself that the United States basically after the war made sure in fact is they were literally forced that most uh, Wehrmacht generals generals marshals what have you and senior officers they were writing their memoirs and they were uh, basically describing how Germans fought and when you look at it it's just like my gosh basically the whole American view on the World War II and actually the way they develop their school of thought and the way of fighting is based around German concepts of the warfare. And if not talking for this not really large uh, Slavic military study department in the uh, General Staff College in the uh, Kansas Leavenworth, which was organized, founded by David Glantz and con conducted some ex extraordinarily good uh, studies on the Red Army and Soviet, uh, Soviets, how they fight the war, you would have nothing. You would have uh, American officers who write their dissertations, for example, for their uh, uh, postgraduate uh, studies or who study some things in their, let's say, even in the West Point or elsewhere, it was primarily like 90% shaped by the perceptions of Germans. Apart from the fact that obviously German Wehrmacht generals who have been defeated, mind you, they never raised the flag over the Kremlin, Actually, these were those Ruskies who raised the flag over the Reichstag. But a point is, that view of the warfare, the way it was done and it was fought, shaped fundamentally the American experience and American military school, which we can see today. Everything of it done in Ukraine perfectly because they don't, it's a, they bear all hallmarks. You may say, huh, how do they bear all hallmarks? I already showed you that uh, basically the whole thing uh, about uh, study and education of American officers is dominated by the German points of view. And in order for, for you to understand this, let me show you what was happening in the Kharkov uh, uh, Oblast region for the last several days. And look at this. Let's go back to 1943, Operation Citadel. That's famous Operation Citadel, where it's actually a region, original battle of the bulge, and it was battle of the bulge on the Kursk bulge in 1943, where Germans, you see their conception of the strategic Operation Citadel? It is, was very simple. Snip off or basically cut out this bulge with the bulk of Soviet Red Army forces in it. And how did we do it? Absolutely. You break on the flanks. You know, you see that? That's how it was conceived. 
guess what we have next after that if you look attentively at actually result when the initial uh, stages of the operation citadel which started on the 5th of july 1943 you can take a look immediately and see for yourself on the right side kursk and the vicinity starting from the july and this, uh, what you have seen shown is the uh, initial stages of the battle. You see those uh, red expanding bulges on the north, north and the south of the Kursk salient. Yes, if you look at the scale of miles, you will see yourself that uh, basically the deepest they penetrated, for example, on the south, the Hof penetrated on the south and his... Um, and Manstein army group. Uh, it's w basically uh, around, you would say, uh, 50, 45 miles in depth uh, and trying to basically unify or join the other thrust on the north on which model was conducting. And you can see yourself that also it went kind of deep into the 40 miles. Guess what you have here? You have here, if you put together all those uh, penetration areas, you will get, well, about probably um, 2,000, 1,500 kilometers, square kilometers of the area which Germans ventured into. And then, of course, as you all know, after that, the counteroffensive started and those bulges uh, or penetrations have been eradicated. And after that, the strategic offensive started uh, uh, on the Ariel Kursk uh, 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 strategic uh, direction and we know where it all ended up. It all ended up in Berlin. So, you can recognize immediately the whole Blitzkrieg thinking and shock and all thinking by American and British generals because they don't know be better. And here what Blitzkrieg is. Look at this. F several fundamental things. They are very similar to basically modern uh, thinking on the uh, combined arms operations. And as you can see yourself, this is what you do. Several v variants of the Blitzkrieg, which are all based on bypassing and surrounding. Look at this. Or envelopment, if you wish. There is, uh, you know, one main point of attack. What do they look for? Absolutely. Weak point in the defense. Or you can do it, you know what, uh, attackers advanced against weak point, or they advanced against the weak point, open uh, through the opening, then they kind of split, you know, and they begin the envelopment. Or, and you can see yourself on the third, it's pretty much same thing, but in more development, more splits, more arrows, and you can create all kinds of the tactical cauldrons and operational cauldrons, and that's how Blitzkrieg works. And let me tell you, this is precisely how American uh, Pentagon planners think. They don't know anything else, believe me, because they never fought real enemy, which could have actually performed something like what Russians performed in the, uh, uh, in the, in the um, um, Kharkov area. Because they didn't want to be enveloped, because obviously Russians were outnumbered there by some uh, uh, people saying the, uh, up to eight times, which I totally get it. And uh, uh, so what, what do you do in this case? You don't stand and fight unless you want, you, can, you want to commit suicide. You just withdraw, you save your army, you save your forces. And of course, in this particular case, this is what went really badly for uh, American planners and Pentagon in uh, Kherson area where the uh, huge uh, Ukrainian forces w force was wiped out. And so the same is happening right now with Russians withdrawing onto the more uh, uh, sustainable positions. And basically, by now, we already, as I already stated, some, uh, pardon my French, some idiot asked, how do we know that Russians do not provide their, you know, their, uh, what's the name, uh, 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 PSYOP and, you know, real uh, uh, number of their uh, uh, losses of the Ukrainian forces. Well, Russians usually actually underreport them. And there is a track record of them. And yeah, the, the, uh, the losses which uh, Ukraine already sustained basically in uh, Kharkov uh, area are horrendous. And they continue to grow. And, uh, and again, this plan was so clear. It's like, and again, with Russian modern intelligence surveillance and uh, recon, come on, guys. Russians know that there is uh, moving of the forces around. So they see it every day, every day 
probably every one hour to hour. So they know where forces are being concentrated and that's what many people still don't understand. Russians finally pulled the goddamn forces of Russo into the open. And here is the issue. One of the slaps into the face, like in this airplane uh, wonderful segment, was yesterday to demonstrate to uh, uh, Ukraine and to its Western uh, uh, you know, planners and uh, commanders that, hey, if it continues, that's what will continue too, you know. So people who say and continue to, you know, panic and go complete bananas, as I already stated, I will reiterate it again. 99.99% of the bloggers and military analysts on YouTube and in those Telegram channels are frauds. Those people don't know sh and recognize shit from Shinola. They don't know how operations are done. They don't have any uh, uh, information required, sufficient information required to uh, make any serious operational or strategic conclusions. I don't. Die. I'm just saying, hey, when I don't know, I don't know. And that's precisely what I'm saying. I'm not in the front lines. And even if I would have been there at the front line, let's say brigade commander level, I still would not know the conception of the operation. I would be opening only the orders and plans on the tactical level, brigade level, which are told to me. Maybe with a little bit wider issue of the uh, basically communicating and interacting with the adjacent units, other brigade, maybe some uh, division or regiment. I don't know. And that's the whole point. That's what pe many people do not understand. Now, and I want to address before that, that, you know, uh, as Tufir Howard used to say <laughs> in June, the best way to avoid a trap is, is know about its existence. So... Russians know what uh, WSU are up to because they know what the Pentagon is up to because uh, Russia is the only other country which has almost real-time awareness uh, on the b battlefield. And um, because of that, we will see very interesting developments probably in coming days. And, and again, as I stated, uh, Russians just simply withdrew in order to be not in the envelope because Russians know what Blitzkrieg on much higher and better level than, uh, for example, Americans for simple reasons. Russians fought it for five years and they fought it with the best of the best, who uh, obviously American troops and allied troops in 1944 never encountered in the Europe or encountered the shadow, pale shadow of the Wehrmacht, which still ca kind of produced a lot of uh, impression, quote unquote, in Ardennes. Albeit, of course, yeah, uh, heroism of American troops and British troops, but primarily Americans, it helped. And of course, we know what helped in the end in our dance. You all know. It was dissipation of the bad weather and, of course, bringing to bear massive, I mean, manifold advantage of the U.S. and British Air Forces, which just basically did the job after that. So, in this case... Uh, can we compare the uh, situation with the, uh, in Kharkov or Kursk uh, and Kursk? No, absolutely different scales, different uh, tasks, different aims. But I, my task is to show for you the genesis, the way it all comes from. And that's you know, United States always tries to play the only thing it knows. It's the uh, thing which is, of course, what the shock and awe and blitzkrieg. But the problem is, of course, for the United States is it never fought against people who know what mobile defense is. And Russia know this thing really, really well, believe me. And it was demonstrated in Kharkov. And uh, then that was the slap in the face uh, uh, with yesterday and today attacks on the infrastructure. Now, uh, addressing this final point which I'm really sick and tired addressing. Let me put it up for you. Something which, uh, you know what, I love internet. It really, uh, you know, preserves the record and allows you to refer to yourself. That's me four years ago, 2018. Look what I wrote. Let me read it for you and you may understand what I was talking about. Here's my blog. And let me read you the conclusion. In 2018, here's Putin's conundrum. 
He promotes, granted with some justification, Ukrainians as relatives of Russia, who, in the end, will come home. Moreover, Sergei Lavrov was explicit two days ago in his interview to Komsomolska Pravda compared that Russia is interested in a whole, stable and prosperous Ukraine, and that is why it does not recognize LDNR. Was Lavrov bluffing? Very well could be. In the end, it was Lavrov who a week ago described the scale of Russophobia in Ukraine as unprecedented and being an official policy of the state. He is absolutely right here. Does Russia political top consider a scenario when it will be forced to annihilate Ukrainian troops trying to provoke Russia? Absolutely. Does Russia have plans of indeed disposing of a Bandarite regime in Kiev? Yes, but there is also an important factor playing into these considerations. Overwhelming majority of Russians doesn't really view Ukrainian nation as it formed in the last decade as friendly or relative. So what is at stake here? Russians do not want to denazify, which is tantamount to de-Ukrainization of this hellhole in the middle of Europe. But it is very well might be that at some point Russia will simply have no other option but to finish off this Western freak show next to her borders and will try to mobilize some competent and courageous forces within Ukraine. LDNR is a first candidate for this, for a complete reconstituting of the Ukrainian state as normal, more or less prosperous nation friendly to Russia. But that is a separate discussion which involves the fate of the so-called Ukrainstva as anti-Russia as such. And here I want to uh, stress immensely for those uh, cry babies who say, oh, but Russians are leaving, you know, and they are going to kill and, you know, uh, uh, and torture and rape and pillage those pro-Russian uh, uh, citizens. You know what? I have to repeat today what Dmitry Alov also writes really well. I will repeat this again. The evacuation of those areas was ongoing now for two weeks. People who wanted to leave and people were warned what is coming to them, they already left. They are either in uh, camps which are on Russian territory, fully secure, provided with everything, or they already moved around to Russia into different uh, cities where they will become the citizens, you know, if later they will want to return to their places. So, in this particular case, the, it is what it is. Russians cannot anymore protect those people who had actually more than two weeks, we are talking about months, uh, uh, an opportunity to go to Russia and start new life. If they wanted to continue with the old one, it's their choice. I'm sorry guys, militaries are not in this uh, 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 business, so to speak, of protecting of the uh, uh, civilian population by means of not allowing to be killed by means of the Uni United Nations peacekeepers. No, this is a war. This is special military operations and military uh, decides its own uh, you know, fate in this particular case and uh, follows its own objectives. In the end, which, as our good friend Large, uh, he uh, is an excellent poster in my blog, absolutely stated, in the end, you solve the fundamental issue. You win the war, and that's what in the end provides the safe and secure future for the civilians. But you have to understand, Ukraine is rapidly anti-Russian. And majority of Ukrainian population lost no life, no love for Russians. So you have to keep this in mind. And believe me, this is another issue which, for example, Russian general staff considers when they plan things. And believe me, as I already stated, I will repeat it again. Uh, they are the best in the world in doing this, okay? And war is a serious business. And for people who want to be in the fast food and uh, the dopamine uh, um, addiction, with the instant gratification of the immediate changes on the front and everything, you know what, guys, uh, then uh, you are on the wrong channel here and you're reading the wrong uh, books and the wrong uh, uh, blog, which is mine. So this is what I wanted to tell you today, and I hope so that uh, you understand what is the message, including this stupid message of 9-11. Just follow whatever you want to think about it. I mean, just leave me, me with my convictions and my thought on this issue to myself. I mean, I do not promote either way, you know. So you guys have a nice, nice uh, rest of the week, and please, those who can afford, please support me on Patreon, and of course, uh, subscribe to my channel on the YouTube. I'll talk to you later, guys. Bye-bye.